can sort of just come in and take those resources. And actually, I'll drop this a bit. Global capitalism, oops, global capitalism can come in and take those resources. Okay, so step two is dislocation. Step three in the process is resource accessibility. We need to gain access to these resources. So in step three, you can imagine, and this is resource accessibility, right? Resource accessibility. So if it's mining, we're going to destroy the land, right? We're going to take off the cross, destroy the land, get to the, the minerals we need. If it's water, we're going to absorb all the water. If it's forestry, we're going to destroy the forest. So we need to be able to access the resources in step three. So resource accessibility is the third step. Let me flip forward, sorry. And what I've written is, uh, with respect to resource accessibility, destruction of natural habitat environment to gain access to the resources, which is why I've said um, there should be more sort of inter interdisciplinary discourse between environmental scientists, archaeologists, sociologists, um, in the crossover between uh, indigenous human rights concerns and environmental rights, right? Because you can't, for me, uh, you can talk about environmental rights without talking about indigenous rights, but you can't talk about indigenous rights without talking about environmental rights, right? To say that again, um, it's a bit complicated. But you can talk about environmental rights independent to indigenous rights. But you cannot talk about indigenous rights without also talking about environmental rights. Invent indigenous rights are an extrict for me, at least. You know, feel free to challenge me because I don't think anybody said that. But you can't talk about indigenous rights without also recognizing that you're talking about environmental rights. All right. So resource accessibility is number three. Number four is the process of extraction. Right. So now we need to extract this resource, said resource, whatever that resource is, right? Now we need to extract uh, the resource, so extraction is four. Number five, um, after extraction, obviously this is conceptual, after extraction, the resource has to be processed, right? The resource has to be processed and then turned into a product this is where free trade agreements and sort of the global capitalism as sort of an operationalized machine comes into place. All right, so five is um, processing. And specifically what we're talking about is processing of the raw material, right? Processing the rubber, processing sugarcane, processing what have you, right? Um, and then finally, number six is uh, product formation, right? So that we take this natural resource and we transform that natural resource into capital. Right? So number six is product for, for RM. We transform that product into capital, right? So we, one, locate a resource. Two, dislocate the population. Remember, dislocation can be forced migration, it could even be forced extermination. Um, then we access the resource in question, then we extract the resource in question, then we process the resource in question, and then we turn a profit. And that's how you generate capital. Right? So that uh, the argument is that um, global capitalism is inherently, um, this is the argument, exploitative in its worst sense. But to be specific with respect to the discourse on global capitalism and indigenous populations is that global capitalism is parasitic on the territorial and ancestral lands of indigenous populations, right? These lands are, are used and the resources from these lands are used in order to sustain their sustenance, their survival, and insofar as global capitalism dislocates the population or directly exterminates members of the pop, and I'm saying global capitalism is sort of a boogeyman. This is generalized discussion, so you get it. Um, uh, we have we have a huge human rights violation. There isn't a recognition of individual human beings as an end in themselves and not a means to an end, right? The na navi, navi the navi aren't a means to unobtainium. The navi are they're beings in and of themselves, and I think Cameron displayed that wonderfully. They showed the emotion 
and the connectedness that the humans had to this otherwise foreign, foreign group. Right? Just given a little bit of time, you can recognize the similarities in pain and suffering and joy and angst and anxiety and fear, trepidation, agitation, what have you, liberation. You know, it's sort of like universal in a sense, emotional connection. Um, but all of that was for naught at the expense of uh, an obtainium, right? at the expense of resource. Why? That resource brings wealth, and with wealth comes power and so on. There is another way to generate power without wealth, right? You can, you can be, people don't believe this, but you can be very, very powerful and not have much money. You gotta be really sharp, though, intellectually, uh, in order to do that. So, the consequences then, to sort of like wrap this up, the consequences, right? The first thing is uh, dis dislocated population. Right? Dislocated population, or even, in worst case, a, a, an exterminated population. Right? A dislocated population, exterminated population. Again, uh, wonderfully depicted in the movie Avatar where the tree collapses. Think about the, the thousands and thousands and thousands of Navi lives that were lost in the collapse of the tree. Right? The fact that they were firebombing the tree. You know, we don't care about the lives of these people. We want to get more resources, and we want those resources at your expense. Uh, ge genius, genius, flay. Now, number two, um, environmental degradation. Right? Uh, environmental degradation. Uh, again, the collapse of the tree, the destruction of their natural habitat at the expense of global capitalism. Number three, uh, unsustainable consumption and environmental exploitation, right? The, the idea is, until we find that sort of uh, infinite source of generating wealth, which I, it doesn't exist, well, it might, I'm not going to get into that, but it might exist. I'm not going to discuss it on the internet, though. But that infinite source of generating wealth, until we find that thing, then it's the case that all these other things are, are finite, right? Resources are limited by definition. So with respect to the limitation inherently of these resources, global capitalism is going to continue to spread, if you want to think of it in a sci-fi level, throughout the universe. Not just the globe, throughout the universe, right? On a sci-fi level. Consume the earth till there's nothing left and move out and then consume space. Right? It's, it's, it's parasitic. Um, in that sense, in a, a very sort of pessimistic interpretation. And then number four, I, I just said that, number four, and then international human rights violations, right? The, the human rights of indigenous population, this actually ends the section on indigenous population and, and their rights. Um, human rights violations are, are going to be inherent in the systematic targeting of territorial and ancestral lands at the expense of uh, members of the indigenous population if you fail to recognize the indigenous population, right? If you begin with a failure of recognition, that's the point. This is why I'm doing this, right? <laughs> if I'm doing anything right. Um, if you begin with a failure to recognize the indigenous population, then this is what's going to happen. And my argument isn't some sort of feel-good moral argument. That's not my style. I, I, I could, I don't do it here, and I won't do it here, but I've done this in a book that will be coming out shortly. Give good economic business sense. Forget about the rights if you don't want to care about the rights of human beings in and of themselves. If, if, if the monster that we're dealing with is so corrupt that I can't get you to stop doing what you're doing based on sort of the rights that we have as human beings, then just think about it on a business level, right? It's just bad for business. As an example, it's completely tangential. In the discourse of torture that I've already had, um, the argument is if we go to privatize systems, maybe privatization of systems, we know that it's a bad thing, we know all the problems that it can manifest, but maybe there's some good in it insofar as torture would be bad for a private system, uh, right? If the word gets out that Wackenhut as a private firm was torturing inmates, it would be a bad business model because people would be less likely to invest capital, shareholders would be compromised, so that we're not motivating um, human rights based on human rights, we're motivating human rights based on economic um, sanctions and economic threats to, you know, shareholder, stockholder um, shares, right? So 
sort of a very perverse way of looking at human rights, but I think, to be honest with you, sort of the incessant, continual moral discourse, it gets a little tiring, right? You, as we saw, compassion fatigue is a real problem. Oh, you ought not to, you should, you must care. The point is, the Navi are in the way, right? We need to kill them to get to the unobtainium. And it, you might think it's bad, but there's tons of people in the world that are willing to be the henchmen to go out there and slaughter the Navi, right? You don't have to give them much, except for a loaded machine gun and, uh, and a motive to kill. So, you know, sitting around and talking about peace and happiness and, you know, slipping rose petals in, in, in AK-47s is not going to get you very far with a group of people who are hell-bent on getting resources at your expense. If, however, you can show them, listen, this is a bad business model. Forget about the people, but don't you see how this could interfere with you getting money? Well, on a ghetto level, that might be, <laughs> that might be an advantage to recognize the rights of human beings. It's unfortunate you have to reason on that level, but sometimes you do. So, uh, again, uh, I, I hope what I was able to do was to, to get you to recognize that the role of indigenous people um, with respect to their human rights is, is seldom, seldom ever sort of discussed within academia, but uh, luckily we, we've got some forward-thinking movie directors that are doing quite a bit to bring light to um, sort of the plight of indigenous populations through just amazing visual depictions. So shout out to James Cameron for uh, uh, an awesome flick. I might actually go home and watch it tonight. So um, with that being said, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.